Uh, actually come here about uh, four or five times a year. We work with uh, Matt Wheeler's lab uh, to do uh, pig surgery as part of our large animal work. Um, in fact, we'll probably be back in two or three weeks or so. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, a topic I call modular engineering of tissue reconstruction uh, scaffolds. And my talk today is split up into four parts. I'm going to first go over an introduction and talk about the challenges we face in translating tissue engineering therapies and talk about the need for what I call modularity, but it's not my term. It's been around for a long time. And then specifically, I'm going to talk about how do we um, incorporate modularity into all aspects of scaffold engineering from uh, scaffold design to scaffold fabrication and functionalization and then the um, application of modular scaffolds in different models from small animal to preclinical and even uh, clinical applications to say does it really make a difference uh, in translating these therapies. So I think most of everybody in the room is familiar with the idea and the paradigm of uh, regenerative medicine. Uh, what you may not know is the idea of regenerative medicine, tissue engineering has been around for 25 years. It was first coined at, a, I believe, an NSF meeting or by an NSF program officer in 1987. What we know, though, is that you don't see a lot of tissue engineering therapies out there in clinical use, despite the fact that it's been around as a discipline for 25 years. There are a lot of theoretical advantages to tissue engineering. Obviously, we can create customized shapes and graphs like implants. But the thought is we also get adaptation and integration of these natural tissue implants like we would with graphs. So it gives you the best of, theoretically, the best of both worlds. But there are significant disadvantages when you consider tissue engineering compared to the competing clinical therapies. And these include that it's largely experimental. We've seen little patient use. And tissue engineering therapies, compared to a, a lot of what is done clinically, are very complex therapies. And those are some of the reasons we see that it's not made much progress into the clinic. So when you think about what are the challenges to translating tissue engineering therapies to the clinic, I split these up into two, what I call the technical challenges and what I would call the business and regulatory challenges. And the reason that we've thought about this idea of modularity is that these challenges tend to push us in different directions. I would say that technical challenges tend to push us towards complexity, to make more complex therapies, to add more growth factors, add more cells. Whereas the business, the regulatory challenges, they're going to push you to simplicity. Because the more complex you make the therapies, the more it's going to cost to develop them, the more difficult it's going to be to get those through regulatory approval. So in terms of the technical challenges, we have to be able to really uh, define multiple reconstruction and scaffold requirements. We have to be able to regenerate composite tissues, make these both, in, in the case of mechanical tissues, load-bearing, and have these scaffolds degrade. That's quite a challenging uh, hurdle to overcome. And we have to really, as we see, I think we have to integrate multiple technologies to achieve this end. And beyond that, we have to be able to develop these into scalable processes and, and build quality systems around that because that's what the FDA is going to require. But when you look at the business challenges, even though technically trying to achieve all these goals will push us towards more complexity, the regulatory challenges and the business challenges tend to push us in the opposite way. Uh, in terms of the regulatory path, obviously the more complex the make, you make the technology, the longer it takes to get regulatory approval and the more expensive it is to get regulatory approval. Also, when you're looking for venture investment, so there's no way F, uh, NIH funding or NSF funding, whether it's regular R01 grants or SBIRs, is going to fund a therapy all the way into clinical use, or very rarely will it. So therefore, if you really are interested in getting therapies into clinical use, you're going to have to go out and try to get venture funding. And venture capitalists are very uh, skittish when it comes to saying you have to do a large clinical trial because it costs a lot of money and there's a lot of risk involved. So all of these business challenges tend to push back and push us as developers of tissue engineering therapies to make them simpler. <coughs> 
So the question is going to be, well, I'm going to go on and define these challenges in more specifics now, but how do we satisfy both sides? And that's what I'm going to talk about. But first, one of the difficulties in satisfying both sides of this equation is, in many cases, we're not really sure what the requirements should be for tissue engineering therapy. So specifically, I always ask myself when we're designing and engineering scaffolds, what, what must this scaffold do? And I've tried to come up you know, with this fancy handle here. I call it the four Fs. Form, fixation, function, and formation. That's what scaffolds should do in a, in a nutshell. That's, that's my thought. Form, obviously, because scaffolds have to be able to fill complex defects. Fixation, and this is something I think we overlook quite a bit when we're engineering scaffolds. Uh, those scaffolds have to be attached to some surrounding tissue, and you have to have a way to correctly attach these scaffolds. Function, I talked about uh, load bearing for definitely skeletal defects, but other areas as well. You must be able to bear deficit, defect specific forces. And if your scaffold is resorbable, you have to engineer so that transitions load bearing from the scaffold to the newly forming tissue. And then, of course, formation. I mean, the scaffold is not just a piece of material that sits there to bear load. It should help enhance tissue regeneration uh, and also control it. Uh, and that could be through delivery of appropriate biofactors, being designed for appropriate mass transport, et cetera. So we know that generically, I think everybody could agree that these are some requirements that scaffolds have to fill. And the difficulty, though, is how do we start these, even though on the surface they, they seem plausible, it's really difficult to quantitatively define these requirements and come up with guidance as how to do this. So one idea is um, where we can gain guidance is looking at tissue the, tissues themselves. Tissues are obviously hierarchical materials. They have stru structure function relationships, so we know that the way that the tissues are put together determines their effective properties like their, it's hard to see here, but their effective elastic properties, uh, linear or nonlinear elastic, effective permeability, diffusion, et cetera. So that's a way to, we can get some guidance in terms of, of the design in that we can look at the effective properties of the tissue we're trying to replace. Of course, uh, uh, I don't think we can ever replace the complexity of nature and the, and the very complex hierarchical scale from the nanometer to the uh, millimeter scale. But it gives us some guidance, perhaps, as to the paradigm we can use to engineer scaffolds. And that's to create multiple processes to put together components to eventually make a scaffold that gives us certain desired functional outcomes. So in summary, in terms of the technical challenges, they're, they're quite substantial. I mean, I think I always, as I mentioned, I always ask myself this question, what is the best or even a good scaffold for a specific application? And I think we still don't really have a handle on that, whether it's bone, cardiac tissue, skin, what have you. Uh, we don't know, perhaps, what are the best materials to use. Uh, we don't even know if there is a best material to use for a scaffold. We don't know what the best mechanical properties are. Should the mechanical properties match that of native tissue? Can they be lower? Because in many cases, that's not possible. What are the right mass transport properties? What are the right biologics to use on the scaffold, and how should we deliver those? And also, you have to remember that you have to build this all in a package that surgeons like to use, and they don't have a, a problem using, because as the surgeons don't like to use it, it's never going to get used. And I think to come up with answers to these questions requires our ability to formulate and test what I would call design hypotheses. So that means we have to create scaffolds with a range of control properties and be able to test those in appropriate animal models. And to achieve this, in other words, making scaffolds with control properties requires realistic and robust integration of design, manufacturing, and functionalization so we can create these platform technologies that we can test in various forms. So those are the technical challenges I think we face in creating scaffolds for tissue engineering. And that would be difficult enough, but then you have to look at the other side of things, and those are the business regulatory challenges. So we have to, if we want these scaffolds not just for basic science purposes, but for clinical use, we have to be able to get these scaffolds through regulatory approval. 
And first of all, I have to recognize that every regulatory approval is for specific clinical indication. So you might make a scaffold as a dental bone, bone void filler, but if you want to use that in the spine, you have to go through another complete regulatory path and testing to do that. And then you have to think about what path you're going to go through. If you're looking at a scaffold alone, which in most cases won't solve the regeneration problem, you can probably get that through a 510K, what's called a 510K process or class two device, where in many cases you don't have to do human clinical trials, you will probably have to do an animal model, do biocompatibility testing. Once you stick a biologic on that scaffold, unless you do it completely in the operating room, uh, then that device automatically becomes a combination device, a class three device. It's now regulated by two different branches of the FDA at once, which is not a pleasant thing. Um, and it's going to definitely require that you do what's called an IDE, get an investigational device exemption or investigational new drug uh, to eventually get what is pre-market approval so you can test it in humans. And this is the sort of thing that, you know, definitely venture capitalists don't like to see. And then as I mentioned, uh, getting federal funding is probably not enough to get uh, therapy into clinical use. You have to probably get in venture or maybe industrial funding. And this means that you're going to have, have to have a certain market size. If you're only treating 500 patients a year, it's very doubtful that you're going to get people to invest in that therapy. And another uh, key, as I mentioned, to getting venture funding is the regulatory path. The more complex the regulatory path, the more risk, the more uh, unlikely you are to get funded unless people really believe it's going to be a blockbuster. And you have to have intellectual property protection because, again, nobody's going to invest unless you have some protected intellectual property. Finally, that's not enough just to get regulatory approval for it to be successful. You have to have physician acceptance, which means you have to compare, think about comparing your uh, tissue engineering therapy against a competing clinical therapy. It may not be a tissue engineering therapy. It may just be a grafting material. But you have to prove that your therapy is better than what is out there or is cheaper or is both. Tissue engineering therapies in the main are unlikely to be cheaper than other therapies, so you have to really prove that they're better. So in addition to doing all these, to facing all these technical challenges and engineering a scaffold that addresses all of these issues, you also have to worry about these issues as well. Some things we don't typically think about uh, in an academic setting. So this requires putting in a lot of thought about targeted design. In fact, this is a figure from the FDA design control guidance document. So the FDA requires that you think about the user needs. The user is the surgeon and the patient. And that means early on, we tend to do a lot of basic research uh, in academics, and that's great, and that's important, and it's fundamental to other work, to other advances. But if you're really interested in, in getting technology into clinical use, you really have to start thinking about specific applications, craniofacial, spine, cardiac, et cetera. You have to go to the users, the surgeons, and even patients, and find out what is the need for a scaffold, you have to design, as I mentioned before, quantitative uh, embodiments of those requirements. So the surgeon may say, I want something that you stick in there and it makes a lot of bone and it heals in two months and it has enough mechanical support for the patient. And then you say, of course, everybody wants that. Uh, but the question is, how do you define that specifically? What are the mechanical properties that are necessary? What are the mass transport requirements? What biologics should you deliver to fill these requirements? The FDA is going to require that you have quantitative design targets that, and then have a design process and show that that design process actually produces design outputs that meet these quantitative design requirements. And then finally, when you actually build that scaffold, you're going to have to do characterization, mechanical testing, uh, materials characterization, imaging to show that this, com as is completed device, actually will meet the user needs. So that's just the beginning. You have to really think about specific design processes, uh, and that's required by the FDA. Then, of course, the other challenge is the fact that depending upon the regulatory path on which you're going to be headed, you have significant time and monetary requirements to get there. 
a 510K pathway. So what the 510K pathway means is that there is essentially a device out there already approved by the FDA that your device is very similar to and therefore the FDA believes they have enough experience with that particular device and clinical indication that they have developed bench standards for that and an animal model that you can test it in. And if you test your device side by side with the predicate device, then you can get approval. But even this pathway, uh, and these are numbers from Tony Radcliffe, who was one of the uh, initial principals in advanced tissue sciences, um, is going to cost between five to $20 million and take about three to four years to get into, into the clinic. And having been involved in a startup, I can tell you these numbers are, are pretty good. Even for a well-known technology, it's, it's going to easily cost you three to five million. If your technology is not similar to a predicate device, and you have to go what is called the IDE, Investigational Device Exemption, PMA pathway, for a device alone, you're looking at a 50 to $200 million cost and six years to get into clinical use. And that's mainly because of doing clinical trials and having patient follow-up. But you have to do GLP animal studies. You have to submit, in this case, what would be an IDE, do a phase one safety clinical trial, do a phase two efficacy clinical trial, and then get submit and review. If you're looking at the typical tissue engineering therapy where we're looking to combine a biologic with a device, then you're looking at 50 to $300 million and eight years to get clinical approval. Yep. So does that mean if somebody gets a PMA, they blaze the trail for the whole field and then it's five, 10 Ks after that? No, not, not necessarily because the FDA has to make a decision to downgrade that device to class two. So spine cages were a very uh, prime example of this. So spine cages were just downgraded, I believe about two years ago to class two. So before that, even though you know Medtronic had uh, approval for uh, a spine cage, if you wanted to develop a spine cage, you still had to go through human clinical trials and get a PMA and everything. Once they downgraded it and said it's class two, then they publish certain guide, guidance, uh, guidelines, and then you do certain bench tests or certain ISO te uh, ASTM standards that you test it towards. And, uh, the animal model still, and this is the other thing I think is difficult about the FDA, even if you go into a do guidance document, let's say for spine fusion, they don't tell you you should use this animal model to test it. You have to sort of propose that, and then they can decide whether that's an appropriate model or not. So just because somebody gets it approved once doesn't mean it'll be a 510K. But. And this is just giving an example of what um, uh, Medtronic has gone through to get BMP approved for different indications. So again, just because you get BMP2 approved once for use in the body doesn't mean it's approved for everything. You have to, every time you want to use it uh, in a different manner or use it with a different carrier, you're likely going to have to do clinical trials again. So um, Medtronic has gotten approval by the FDA for BMP2 use for three indications. The first one was lumbar inner body fusion. Uh, to get there, they did uh, a, a large animal study with uh, 24 sheep. Uh, they did a, a non-human primate study with 15 monkeys, and they did a phase one, phase two human trial. Phase one human trial, 14 patients. Phase two, 413 patients where they compared BMP2 in a metal cage um, to bone graft. Uh, they got it approved for uh, tibial non-unions. Again, you can see the numbers that they're going towards. 175, or 48 dogs, 127 rabbits, 22 sheep, 42 uh, non-human primates. The phase two clinical trial, 300 patients. Uh, dental applications for sinus lift and ridge augmentation. Uh, you can get all this data actually on the FDA website. I had to estimate this, about 60 to 128 uh, dogs. 30 to 60 non-human primates, about 300 patients. So every time they wanted to get BMP2 approved for a different indication, and in, in some cases the same carrier, they have to go through this all again. So you can see again the complexities that are involved. 
Uh, they did not get approval for the uh, posterior lateral fusion for the lumbar spine. There were some concerns about cancer in the BMP2 group versus control, and I believe they're going to try to get that approval again. So what I wanted to illustrate is sort of a long introduction, but the challenge you, that you face in getting a uh, tissue engineering therapy into clinical use. There are the technical challenges of just making sure it works. I mean, to re regenerate tissues, especially large tissue defects, is very complex, requires complex technologies. However, on the other side, complex technologies are expensive. Uh, they take a long time to get regulatory approval, and that makes the chances that they will ever make it to the clinic uh, much less. So what we have to find is a way to mitigate between these two different sides to make the therapy or the scaffold complex enough that, that it can do the job technically, but not make it overly complex that it's difficult and more difficult and expensive than it needs to be to get regulatory approval. And I think that requires, or at least my belief, is it requires a, a way of thinking about how we engineer scaffolds. And this is where um, probably reading is a dangerous thing. I was reading this book by Brian Author. It's very good. It's called The Nature of Technology, What It Is and How It Evolves. And it's like a philosophy history of technology book. Uh, and he talked about how we develop technologies, you know, like the jet engine developed from props and things like that. And people built components, and they built more complex technologies from simpler modules. And I think that's the idea we have to apply in this process, modularity. And it's a process by which complexity is com created by interconnected assembly of simple modules. And we have to think of the scaffold, I think, as a platform for a modular approach to tissue engineering therapies. But modularity, I mean, it's not a new concept. I mean, intuitively, you know what it is. I mean, you see it all the time in both natural systems as well as engineered systems. I think modularity in tissue engineering on a physical, in a physical sense occurs in three aspects. One is obviously the physical scale. I talked about tissue structure function from nanometer to centimeter scale. The other one is the fact that we use both material and biologics together. So we have material modules and biologic modules that we put together to create a tissue regeneration system. And the other thing is that we can't really do this with one process. So I think even the processes we can think about as modular, designing scaffolds, building them, and functionalizing them with, with growth factors or coatings, et cetera. And I think modularity can help us ad address this conundrum due to the fact that it really allows us to create a, a sliding scale of complexity, if you will, uh, to address technical and regulatory issues. So although it's not a hard and fast proven thing, you can get approval, let's say you develop a scaffold material and a, a good manufacturing process for fabricating that scaffold. You might be able to get it approved initially as a 510K for a bone void filler. Uh, and then if you want to use it as a carrier for BMP2, at least the FDA has familiarity with the material and the process for making the scaffold. Uh, and then it may make, you still have to go through um, uh, large animal models, preclinical animal models, and, and clinical trials, but it may make that process a little bit easier. And this is how I think, you know, this is a very complex drawing, but when you think about, in, for, for example, in the case of bone, this is a way I think we can think about modularity and actually the design and engineering of scaffolds. This is an example we do. This is actually a pig mandible from here. Uh, we make a scaffold, let's say, for TMJ reconstruction. We build a substrate, and to that substrate, we can do certain modifications. We can apply hydrogels, microspheres. Uh, we can coat. Uh, and this is courtesy of Bill Murphy, who we work for. Some of you may know him at the University of Wisconsin, with calcium phosphate coatings to make these scaffolds more osteoconductive for the bone layer, as well as giving us a way to deliver biologics. So each one of these components is essentially a separate physical component as well as a separate engineering process to essentially build this scaffold. So we can break it down and try to get, for instance, regulatory approval for this uh, 3D printing process and material substrate uh, as a bone void filler, but then go on to add other goodies to it and see if we can get approval that way. 
So that way we can eventually step by step build in the complexity we need to engineer a system to fulfill the technical requirement, but maybe make the regulatory process uh, a little bit less painful. So again, a, long, a little bit long-winded introduction, more philosophical, but I would define modularity, and this sort of sets up the rest of the talk in three ways. Uh, one is modular design. So as I mentioned, these scaffolds are inherently uh, hierarchical. They're done on different modular scales, could be from the nanometer scale up to the uh, centimeter scale. And we have different computational design processes that may work on different scales. So in that sense, both the actual implementation of the design as well as the mathematical theory behind the design is modular. We do it at, we do separate design processes at different scales. Secondly, the manufacturing and the functionalization is modular. Uh, they're done in separate processes. We might build the scaffold using 3D printing. We might code it with a, a fluid-based process, simulated uh, body fluid, etc. So this may simplify because we have to only set up GMP processes for one process at a time, the GMP and the regulatory implementation. And finally, in terms of delivering biologics or giving us functional gradients and materials, we can build these scaffolds physically into separate modules that essentially you can assemble in the operating room. And I'll see some examples of that. So that's the philosophy behind the modular engineering of scaffolds. And what I'd like to do in the rest of the talk is give you specific examples of how we implement each aspect of the design, the fabrication, and then the clinical application. So modular scaffold design, we know that scaffolds have to fill complex geometric shapes. They have to provide mechanical stability and function and mass transport. We have to be able to design on scales from microns to hundreds of millimeters. And as I mentioned, one of the things we want to use as a, as a target is maybe look at, at least initially as a guidance, the tissue properties of cells because we assume that if cells like to live in that certain matrix that the mass transport and the mechanical properties should be correct, that we have to be able to take our designs and compute these effective properties. So the solution, I think, is to do modular design. We essentially design the anatomical defect envelope as well as the poor architecture and even the smaller scale entities in separate computational processes. Then we use a mathematical theory called homogenization to compute the effective properties. And then computationally, we integrate the anatomic and the porous architecture designs. Um, so essentially what we're doing from an anatomic viewpoint, we just use commercial software to do this. We use, and we use some MATLAB as well. We use MIMICS. Essentially, we represent t d uh, tissue defects uh, as an envelope, either through uh, voxel density maps or through STL surfaces. And then essentially, we use those um, as flags or markers in 3D space into which we map design microstructure. So that way, we can create a tissue filling scaffold defect that has different architectures and different areas. Uh, in terms of designing porous architecture, we can generate, you know, just standard geometric shapes, spheres, fibers, et cetera, random or periodic packing. We can then uh, calculate, based on these design, their effective properties so we can know for a given material and design how well they compare to tissue properties. But then we can go even one step beyond that and we can do optimization and ask the question, if I want to attain certain effective properties, how should I lay out the material to attain those properties? So that's essentially how, you know, we have to throw in some mathematics because we're engineers here, uh, how we do this. So we solve essentially at a local level, uh, both the standard equations for, well, these are uh, characteristics equations for elasticity and diffusion permeability. And we get a certain characteristic, either displacement or fluid flow. And then from that, we can calculate effective uh, permeability, diffusivity, or effective elasticity. So once we create an architecture, we can use finite element methods to solve these equations. But we can go beyond that. We can ask the question, if I have desired elastic properties, 
and desired diffusivity or permeability properties? How do I arrange a material in 3D space to minimize the difference essentially between my desired properties and what the architectural will give me. So that's essentially incorporating these equations into an optimization procedure. So that's another way we can design the local architecture. And this just gives you some examples of what, what comes out of this. So intuitively we know that designing for mass transport and structural properties uh, brings us into conflict. Because if we want the best permeability or diffusivity possible, we just make a, a complete void space, right? But void space doesn't do a very good job at supporting mechanical loads. So if we want really stiff and strong load-bearing structures, we just make it completely solid. But that doesn't work either. So we have to find the compromise. But the difficulty is there are mathematical and physical bounds as to what we can achieve with these compromises. So essentially what we're doing in the optimization is we're trying to think about move material in space to achieve these bounds. So if we tell ourselves I can use 20% material, 40% or 50%, these bounds tell us what we can achieve, but it doesn't tell us how to actually put the material together to achieve these bounds. So that's what the optimization does. It essentially predicts uh, configurations of pore structures that will give us the desired effective properties. So this is just an example of doing modular design at let's say the millimeter scale level or, or sub-millimeter scale where we're designing pore structure. What we can then do from a modular point of view is in this case, this is an example of de designing a spine fusion cage for a pig. Uh, we can make a, an anatomic finite element model of the forces that pig puts on the design space and this is our design space and then we have commercial software topology optimization that tells us globally how we should distribute material and will tell us oh in this region you need 30 percent material and in this region you need maybe 80 uh, 20 percent material and then that microstructural optimization technique i just showed you gives us the specific form of that microstructure and we just map it in in there using this voxel density and we create a final structure and then using some techniques I'll talk about in a minute we build that. So this is the way that we're trying to integrate modular design to create scaffolds that have certain desired effective uh, properties whether they're mass transport properties or mechanical properties. So the next question that's all fine and dandy we can build we can design these complex structures how do we actually build these and use these? So obviously it's, it's difficult to build these structures using sort of traditional manufacturing techniques. So we essentially do it using technologies that we call solid freeform fabrication or 3D printing or rapid prototyping. Uh, so this gives us the ability to build these complex structures. The other thing is if we're thinking about clinical application, we can't just build like, you know, typically five or 10 we might use in an experiment. We have to be able to build hundreds of these or thousands of these. So that's where having automated fabrication processes is very important. And we have to reproducibly build these scaffolds so that they have a mean property of X of let's say plus or minus 5% of X because that's what FDA GMP is going to require to get approval. So as I mentioned, we're using uh, essentially freeform fabrication or 3D printing to build these scaffolds. There are many of these techniques out there. The difficulty is that None of these tech, uh, uh, technologies come standard with biologic uh, biomaterials, although the bioplotter is supposed to. So you really have to modify whatever biomaterial you're working with to build on these different platforms. We've done this. We did some inverse stuff before, and I'll just show you a video here. But now we use uh, essentially laser sintering. We're building polycapitalactone on this system. So we essentially modified this system and we're able to get polycapitalactone, which is an FDA approved for cranioplasty, uh, to build with this. This is the PCL here. You can see how it builds. It basically sweeps material across and a laser beam comes and centers the material layer by layer. Uh, and you can build, I think these are some spine cages. You can see you can build hundreds of these. So we take those designs we created before, we slice them and then we build them in the system. And 
again, we can use this system. We've used either indirect techniques where we build molds. That gives us more flexibility in the materials we can use, but it's more labor intensive. And now we've gone almost completely to doing the PCL. So you can see we can build fairly complicated anatomic shapes. So that's the first process. So our standard fundamental process for building those materials once we design them at the millimeter scale is uh, to use uh, 3D printing. But of course, cells don't just like to interact with materials at this scale. Cells like to interact with materials all the way down to nanometers. So the ideal thing is to be able to integrate this sort of fabrication with other sorts of materials or coatings or growth factors. And that's what we mean by functionalization. So once you've built these scaffolds, you can then do other processes, maybe fluid-based processes or plasma gas-based processes to coat the inter inter uh, uh, the holes within these scaffolds. So we do this functionalization uh, post-fabrication. Uh, typically, you do it at a pre-OR, pre-operating pre room. But if you're applying cells, because again of regulatory issues, you may want to do that within the operating room because of less regulatory uh, difficulties. So because you can build these things in physical modules, you can apply, you can see apply different growth factors to different modules and then putting them together. So this just shows some things we've done. This is work actually with uh, Bill Murphy. So we actually can take these uh, PCL constructs and his laboratory does a technique, actually it's part of the company now, where you can coat these with nanoscale calcium phosphate coatings, uh, which makes these constructs very good for bone regeneration. Uh, it makes the constructs what we would call osteoconductive, but these coatings are also good for delivering growth factors. The other thing is you can do this with gene therapy. We've done work where we can take viral vectors and through different uh, chemical conjugation techniques, directly attach these vectors, as you can see here, to these design scaffold surfaces. And you can do this with proteins as well. So now you can functionalize these materials with different biologics. So that's sort of the engineering part of this where we can design these scaffolds using modular techniques. We can build them uh, and functionalize them using modular sequ sequential uh, processes. And then the question is, is it really worth it? I mean. Does being able to design these scaffolds or control the design or control the materials or the um, um, functionalization of these materials really matter or is it important for tissue regeneration? Uh, obviously the answer is yes or else I wouldn't have a talk to give you uh, and we wouldn't be able to get any funding. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is some of our studies wrap up talking about some of our studies in vitro and small animal models talk about trying to move this to uh, large preclinical animal models. And then finally, we've started to do initially just now some, some clinical work. So the first thing we want to answer is you know, the question of, we're going through all this process to design pore structures, to build them with certain pore structures. Does it really make a difference for excuse me, tissue regeneration? And specifically, we've done things where we've designed and built scaffolds with a range of permeabilities, as you can see here. And we wanted to test, does that affect in, uh, bone regeneration? That's a tissue we're interested in, in a lot of cases, for craniofacial reconstruction, orthopedics, spine. So this was essentially taking a scaffold, uh, two different scaffolds, both made out of PCL, uh, loading these scaffolds with BMP7 transduced human gingival fibroblasts and putting them into an immunocompromised mouse model. And then we did micro CT on the results at four and eight weeks. And we did this ring analysis where we could look at not only how much total bone is in the scaffold, but how well does the bone penetrate over time into the interior of the scaffold. And what you see here is uh, the low permeability scaffold this value at four weeks, high permeability at four weeks, low permeability at eight weeks, and low or high permeability at eight weeks. In the outermost ring, uh, second outermost ring, second innermost ring, and the innermost ring. And what you can see is that permeability definitely makes a huge difference in the amount of bone penetration in that the highest permeability scaffold at eight weeks in the most interior parts of the scaffold had much uh, greater bone growth 
than the lower permeability scaffold. So being able to, and it's sort of intuitive, to get higher vascular, vascular invasion, higher permeable scaffolds lead to more bone growth. And, then, and although the data is not as strong, we also want to know cartilage is a rather avascular tissue. Would the opposite hold for cartilage? If, is it better to have lower permeable scaffolds for cartilage growth? And it turns out this is a mixed bag. It depends on how you're trying to grow the cartilage. If you're using primary chondrocytes versus chondrogenically pulsed bone marrow stroma cells. And as I said, the evidence is not as strong here. This is totally an in vitro study. But what we found in terms of both gag production and gene expression for collagen 2, collagen 2 being more uh, prevalent in cartilage matrix and collagen 1, chondrocytes do better if they're in a lower permeable environment, at least in vitro, whereas chondrogenically pulsed BMSC do better in a high permeable environment. And probably for a BMSC, because part of the thing you're doing is pulsing them, you're giving them growth factors in the fluid, the more you can get that fluid into the scaffold, the better for those cells, and that's probably why they, they, make, they express more cartilage genes and make more cartilage matrix when you, they're in the higher permeability scaffolds. Another area we're looking at is the effect of scaffold architecture in periodontal disease. So this is a collaboration we have with Will Ginobili at the dental school at the University of Michigan. They have a model of periodontal disease in the rat where essentially you get bone erosion around the tooth root and loss of the periodontal uh, ligament. Uh, and we make uh, scaffolds. Uh, these are uh, composite PLA, PCL scaffolds. And because of the design and, and fabrication technologies, we can make these either with random pore structures or with oriented pore structures. And these pores essentially, it's hard to see here, but you can see the sort of red area here. These go against the tooth root, and we put in PDL cells in the innermost area, and uh, BMP7 transduced human gingival fibroblasts in the outermost area. And we wanted to see, again, does it make a difference? And the answer is yes. You can see that in terms of the, the bone regeneration around the tooth root, that this is the random scaffold, and this is the oriented pore scaffold. And we know that, uh, in looking at this, that having the oriented pore scaffold gives us significantly greater bone growth around the tooth root, as well as, I don't show the data here, but more oriented ligament fibers that grow up uh, to the uh, cementum. Another application, spinal cord injury. So this is a transected rat model. Uh, again, looking at different architecture designs of the scaffold, putting it in a, a three millimeter defect in the rat transected spinal cord. Uh, and these gray areas here are not blocked off, but they're actually a sponge material. So again, this is the idea of combining fabrication processes where we make a design structure, but inside that design, there's a sponge. And we put these in the defects. We didn't put any factors in the defect, any neurotrophic factors or anything. Uh, and what we find, again, is that in terms of looking at uh, TUJ1 staining as a measure of uh, nerve growth, that the actual design of the scaffold has an effect on uh, nerve regeneration within the defect. In fact, for almost all the scaffolds except for this one, which was designed with open spaces in the white matter, that the defect actually became larger over time in the spinal cord. So these are all you know, small animal studies and in vitro studies that show that design of the scaffold has a significant, I mean, it's not gonna grow tissue where none, is, where none is there before, but the way that you design the scaffold does have a significant effect on how effective uh, tissue engineering therapy is. The other thing we looked at is functionalization. So it doesn't matter if we can functionalize these scaffolds, put on uh, calcium phosphate coatings or put on uh, different growth factors. So again, this is work with uh, Bill Murphy where we took, and again, the advantage of having the controlled design is we can make PLLA scaffolds and PCL scaffolds with the exact same architecture. So that's not a confounding variable. And then we, we've made some scaffolds with the calcium phosphate coating, some without for both the PLLA and the PCL. Again, we put this in the immunocompromised mouse model. It's a very powerful osteogenic approach putting in this gene therapy. And what you see is that the coating has a huge difference 
in terms of the bone growth. The coated scaffolds show uh, statistically greater bone growth, as you see here, than the uncoated scaffolds. Again, that's an intuitive result, but it tells us the importance of doing this modular processing and being able to functionalize scaffolds after we make them. This is the same uh, idea of uh, putting BMP2, conjugating it to PCL uh, in different quantities um, directly to the PCL versus absorbing it. We still get a lot of bone growth either way. This is an immunocompromised model. Uh, but conjugating it, so the way that we attach the, the growth factor, the protein to the scaffold, gives us more control over the location of the bone growth. And this is just putting scaffolds without BMP2 and with BMP2 in a, a three millimeter rat sternal defect. And again, you can see obviously it's intuitive, but being able to deliver this in controlled scaffolds helps us to regenerate tissue. Again, and this is actually work that we do a lot here, we, we come here a lot with Matt Wheeler, uh, is to advance these therapies using the processes, design processes and fabrication processes we, we've developed to large animal defect models. Um, and again, here we're creating a, I don't know, no, I hit the wrong thing. Ah, there we are. Um, uh, we're making these modular scaffolds, so the idea is um, surgically, if you don't know the size of the tumor you're at the resect, resect going in, you can make these mo physically modular scaffolds that the surgeon assembles in the operating room uh, and have some movies here if they work. This just shows the module in the operating room, and this is a sleeve design, so essentially if you wanted to, you could put different biologics on each different module if you wanted. And you can assemble these in the operating room. They have different tabs to assemble them, and you can weld them essentially to fill any complex defect you want with any distribution of biologics. That just shows the assembly, and this just shows the fitting of the sleeve uh, into the defect. And it's hard to see here, but you can see the, uh, if you're squeamish for blood, sorry about that, you have to look out the window. But um, you can see here, this is the defect scaffold, strengthen the defect, and you can put the modules in, etc. So it gives us ease of implantation in the operating room. Um, the results actually, to be, be honest, have been mixed. One of the problems with this sleeve idea is there's a periosteum that covers the bone and soft tissue, and to, to cut the defect, you have to strip the periosteum off, put in the sleeve, but the sleeve probably you put the periosteum back over the sleeve, it blocks vascularization. So this kind of scaffold gives us the mechanical support, it gives us the ability to load biologics separately, but its surgical implementation actually was less than ideal, so it caused, in some cases, uh, bone resorption. So then we've redesigned the scaffold to make it uh, more of an endochondral design, so it doesn't have the sleeve, but it goes into the marrow space. Again, the advantage of this is we do this in a modular sense. This is actually an application in primates um, where we create the modular scaffold. You weld it in the operating room. It has this nano scale coating. We can deliver BMP from that. And this is one of the more successful examples showing that we can get very good bone regeneration in about a four, uh, sorry, a three centimeter defect within the primate jaw. And now we're applying this in the pigs, primates. We actually did this work in Singapore. Primates are very difficult to do. Uh, so, but you know, we're, we're essentially translating this, transitioning this into a pig model. I think they're all completed with the one-year surgeries. Finally, this is our, we have, uh, I'll wrap up here, I'm probably running over, have transitioned this into clinical use. We have done one patient using this approach, the design approach, the uh, 3D printing approach, and this is for uh, tracheal malation. So it's not a really true tissue engineering approach where we're trying to regenerate tissue. This is a case where there's aberrant artery formation that compresses the trachea. The tracheal cartilage rings don't form correctly. And essentially, in this case, it's actually uh, bronchial malation. It's the left bronchus here in the patient. Um, there, people have tried either internal stents or different types of ad hoc splints to do this, to rescue this case. This patient was a three-month-old boy. He was 
uh, transferred to the uh, University of Michigan from Ohio. Uh, he was in the intensive care. He was regularly having uh, coding for respiratory distress. Uh, we got this approved uh, through our IRB and the FDA for the emergency use. We actually get an idea of module design. We designed this using a sort of a bell-shaped design to allow for surgical suturing of the trachea. We have the CT scan of the patient. We try to size the device to the patient's uh, bronchus in this case. Um, and the nice thing about the 3D printing, we actually built about 100 splints for this case uh, that they took into the OR. And we actually built a model for them to try to, of the patient's bronchus, you can see the collapse here of the left bronchus. This is the splint with the suturing holes in the bellow shape. Uh, this is fitting the splint on onto the bronchus here. Uh, my other uh, figure here is not showing up, but this is the actual implementation of the splint in the patient. You can see this is the trachea here, it branches the bronchus. Uh, this is the, the aorta, so um, we're happy to report the splint did work. The patient is doing well, the patient is eight months out, and this is, hopefully this will work. This is uh, his bronchoscopy at six month follow up. You can see going down the trachea here, and then you're going to the left bronchus here. You can see it's, it's been held open well by the uh, splint here. Uh, so this is probably the first device we're gonna try to run clinical trials on uh, to get approval. Again, this is one of the examples that I talked about of the commercial aspect of it in that Patients with severe tracheal malacia, there are probably about 200 a year in the U.S. Patients in which you can use a splint for expanded indication, maybe up to 1,500. But there's probably no commercial company that would uh, take the expense of developing manufacturing capabilities to build such a device. But with the 3D printing and design, we can do this you know, on the cheap. The really expensive part is actually developing of the GMP manufacturing facility and, and getting that up to run the clinical trial. Oh, here's my picture. So this is just a CT scan and a, a computational model. Uh, the red area is on expiration, the, bronch the part of the bronchus when, it, uh, when, he, when he tries to uh, expire air. And you can see that uh, it's totally collapsed. There's no red part in here at all. And the light blue area is the CT scan immediately post-op after you put the splint on, you can see that the blue area is now open. So we think that this idea of the modular design uh, in uh, concluding here may be a way to go to develop clinical devices and, and tissue engineering devices. Uh, I think it's a paradigm that allows to balance the complexity due to technical demands versus the simplicity that's typically required to get through regulatory and, and market demands. The ability to integrate modular design with 3D printing does enable us to create scaffolds with controlled features so we can do this testing of the design hypothesis, methodical testing that will tell us what are the aspects of the scaffold that are most important for tissue regeneration, as well as enabling us to satisfy the FDA design control requirements. Uh, in, in vision, our initial in vivo studies have indicated that certain features of the scaffold, definitely the scaffold for architectural design, its functionalization is important for tissue regeneration. And you know we've had some ups and downs in the pig studies, but you know I think we've also done the tracheal splint in the pig, and it seems to be working now. Uh, and the patient, uh, uh, it's it's definitely we. Worked. There, are, there are reasons that, you know, because we're trying to actually create tracheal collapse in the pig, that there are some difficulties with that. But we think that overall this sort of modular approach um, could be a way to go to develop these devices. Lastly, obviously this is a lot of work. We have a lot of collaborators, a lot of students in the lab that have uh, performed the work for their PhD work that you see me present here. Uh, I sort of highlighted Matt's name, so we do work with uh, Matt Wheeler here at the university, so I, I come down to Champaign probably three or four times a year. Uh, we work with a number of clinicians to develop these devices, as well as some of our other colleagues who do the functionalization, uh, like Will Murphy, and with that I'll end and be happy to answer any questions. <laughs>
modularity can help commercialization. I guess I was wondering, it seems like most historically the FDA approves a device and the device for the pill is the same in everyone. But when you have something like personalized medicine where you're changing either the defect size or the mechanical properties, like if you were filling a bone defect in a young person, old person, and if you change the mechanical properties and the biologics, then doesn't that make it like a fundamentally different device for each person? Yes, that's that's true. So there, um, you're correct in stating that. Let's say if we if we took the same scaffold for bone and, and one scaffold we didn't do any coating and some scaffold we put a coating on. If you want to use that even for the same de bone defect, you would have to because that coating is a new material. You'd have to run it through um, probably a new clinical preclinical model. Um, you would have to do. There's a series of tests called the ISO 10993 test, biocompatibility test. You'd have to run it through a battery. Those tests again. Those cost, depending on how many you need to do, between half a million to two million dollars to do. So you're correct in that um, every sort of change that the FDA would consider fundamental, uh, you might have to do a new battery of tests. However, um, the good thing is, you know, our belief, that, and again, a lot of these things are not hard and fast rules. But let's say we had the um, the, the basic you know PCL encoding approved um, for a bone void filler, and then Medtronic comes and says we want to use this as a carrier for BMP2. So you know at least we won't have to go through the fundamental 10993 test for the, the base material, and then we can look at it as a carrier, and then go directly into preclinical tests and then then a clinical uh, model. Now, there, then there becomes a gray zone of where do you get into custom devices versus off-the-shelf devices. So definitely for off-the-shelf devices. So the FDA is going to regulate a company who wants to advertise and sell a device for certain indications. So when you do that, you know, you have to have GMP processes in place to make the device, and you have to run through the, the IDE and PMA and the clinical trials. If you do the custom device, because theoretically a custom device is a one-off and you're not selling huge lots of it. The FDA, there's no way they can require a clinical trial because you're not um, you know, selling, developing and selling that device to a large market. They will still require that you build that device under GMP processes. So, but again, if theoretically a custom device, it's more expensive to make. And, it's, and if you're building a lot of custom devices, like for JAWS all the time, the FDA, FDA might say, you no, know, really, this isn't a custom device, even though you're, making, you're changing the geometry every time we want you to run a you know, trial. So those things are, there are some things that are laid out in the guidance documents, but some things you have to have. You know, that's why the FDA does pre-IND meetings, pre-IDE meetings to sort of work out these details. That's a good question. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question about the most outstanding challenge If I had to boil it down, you know, I, I think that the regulatory is a significant challenge because I, I mean, the combined sort of developing a, a technology that that addresses a certain problem, whether it's a bone defect or a cardiac defect or what have you, is, is obviously very challenging. But I think on the academic side, because we don't deal with a lot, it's, it's the regulatory process. You know, how do you set up GMP facilities? How do you set up a quality system? Uh, and how do you get through regulatory approval? Um, because it it's very expensive. Uh, a lot of universities, because there's a significant liability, uh, with, because you not only have to build the devices under GMP, you have to follow them if there's an adverse uh, event in the patient, and um, you have to sort of troubleshoot that and figure out why there was an adverse event. So that's a, as our quality person, that, the person that runs our GMP facility, you'll then keeps telling me, <laughs> you know, that's a significant burden for somebody who's not, like for us as a, you know, faculty, you don't do that full time. If you have to deal with that, that's a significant headache. Um, Scientific. Scientifically, you know, I would say we talked about this in some of the meetings we had earlier. 
scientifically, one of the biggest challenges is, especially for highly large tissue defects, is going to be how do we vascularize things? How do we get these? You know, we can do maybe two or three centimeter defects without inherent vascularity because we get peeping vascular invasion. But eventually, if you want to replace, you know, half of somebody's jaw or a big chunk of their femur or whatever, I mean, if you if you see cells in there, they're they're probably going to be dead in the interior of the scapula within a you know a few days or a week. So you have to figure we have to figure out a way to get vascularity in a controlled manner that's not <laughs> gone haywire, you know, like like in something like cancer. So I think. I mean, it's almost one of those things like, you know, where do you start in terms of technical challenges? <laughs> but, you know, making materials that are strong enough, rather the right mechanical properties, et cetera. But I think vascularity and, and figuring out the right bi biological will be the biggest technical challenge. All right, let's thank Scott. Let's